Thank you for coming. Uh, welcome to another colloquium. Our speaker today is Professor Dave Brain, who is with the Astronomy Department at the University of Colorado. He grew up in Maryland, and he got his undergraduate degree at Rice University. Um, and then he moved on to University of Colorado. I guess the degree was what, astronomy? Astronomy, and then he spent uh, quite a few years at the Space Science Lab in Berkeley, up well above the bay there, and then returned, um, oh, about three or four years ago, to University of Colorado as a, as a professor. And he has been involved in studies involving Mars and other objects for a long time, and I have known him due to his work on Mars. We are both as part of the main projects. So the main mission to Mars, one of NASA's. And I'll let him explain what, why we're interested in Mars. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, so there are um, a uh, couple things that I want to get out of the way on this slide. Uh, first of all, my last name really is Brain. It's not my fault. I had nothing to do with that. Um, and Dr. Brain and uh, Professor Brain both just sound spooky. So maybe let's go with Dave. That would be fine with me. Um, and so if you have questions, just say Dave. That's fine. Um, and if you say Professor Brain, that's OK, too. And if you say Dr. Brain, I'll throw something at you. Because um, it sounds like I'm giving a lobotomy when you say that. Dr. Dave. Yeah, let's not mix. OK. Um, and number two, uh, this is going to be a bit of overview about why I love Mars, what interests me about Mars. My goal there is to make you give a darn. OK, and that's related to the title of the talk. Um, and then the other one is something that I haven't done before in an overview talk like this before. So it's going to be an experiment for me, um, which is to take um, some results from my research group, different results from people in my research group, and try and tie them together um, to give you a sense of the um, breadth of physics that people are thinking about uh, with regard to the Mars system, because it's really fun. So let's start off, since this is a physics colloquium, let's start off with some geology. Why not? Um, and the main point here is that Mars used to be wet. We have abundant evidence from orbiting spacecraft and from telescopic observations that liquid water was stable at the surface of the planet for long periods of time. It's bad for you if I move, isn't it? OK. Um, yeah, because you're in for a ride. Uh, this is my favorite picture of Mars ever. It's not the most recent picture at all. It's not the, the fanciest picture. It's a region in Mars in the southern hemisphere called Warrego Vallis. And the top of the image is high elevation. The bottom of the image is low elevation. And all of these cuts that you see in the slope are riverbeds. They're dried up riverbeds. And it's a dendritic valley network, dendritic river valley network, tree branch-like. And as water rolled down hill on the surface of the planet over thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, it incised channels in the surface. Small little channels that maybe weren't so deep and then merged together with other channels to become deeper and broader until at the very end you have you know, a really actually quite significant river feature. And there are valley networks um, um, throughout the surface of Mars in different locations on surfaces of a certain age. That's one type of evidence, and I could spend three colloquia um, telling you all the different pieces of evidence. Here is a river delta. Uh, the Mississippi River transports sediment down, and that drops it all off at New Orleans, basically, and builds new land. The same thing has happened on Mars. This is the floor of a crater, and this broccoli-looking feature is a river delta, the Eberswalde River Delta on Mars. You require liquid water being stable for long periods of time for both of these. This one, Gusev Crater, um, is so interesting that people want to send one of the next landers to this location. There's a group that's advocating for this. This is a three for one. You see a river channel entering the crater, number one, from the southeast. Number two, you see delta-type deposits, maybe, depending upon where you're sitting. You see sediment that's been dropped onto the crater floor. Number three, you don't see a raised crater rim. You can tell it's a crater, but it's not a bowl-shaped crater like these other things. That crater rim has been eroded. 
over time. And to do that, you need a significant atmosphere to cause erosion. Mars has neither a significant at Mars does not have a significant atmosphere, and liquid water is not stable on the surface of the planet for long periods of time, not long enough to be responsible for creating these features. In comparison to Earth, the Martian atmosphere is six millibars or seven millibars, seven one thousandths of one bar. Earth's atmosphere is one bar thick because scientists are lazy, and we define that as one bar, actually 1.015 bars. Okay, uh, the Martian atmosphere is cold. The average temperature is about 55 degrees C below freezing. At its coldest, at the winter pole, it's been measured to be about 170 degrees C below freezing in the winter hemisphere. But on a warm summer day in equatorial regions, it gets up to 25 degrees C in some locations. And there can be liquid water on the surface just for not long periods of time and not globally, just very specific places. Finally, the Martian atmosphere, it's thin and cold. That tells you no liquid surface water. Okay, but even if it were the um, right thickness and were a little warmer, we would not be having this conversation right now because it's 95% carbon dioxide as well. So we'd have a very brief conversation and then we would die. Okay, so these are the three big ways that the Martian atmosphere is different. Okay, so there are two mysteries in one here. Um, if there was stable liquid surface water at Mars billions of years ago, maybe three and a half billion years ago, then Mars, okay, this is an artist exaggeration, but maybe there were standing bodies of liquid surface water. Ignore the green, that's definitely exaggeration. But there were probably significant clouds in this atmosphere. The atmosphere had to have been thicker to support the features that we see on the surface today. But the Mars today is the thin, cold one that we just talked about. I still think it's beautiful, but it's incredibly different. So there are two big mysteries here. Um, number one, where did the water go that caused these features? And that's an interesting question. And the one that motivates me even more is where did the atmosphere go? Because even if we can find the missing water, we need enough atmosphere to have the right pressure and temperature for water to have been stable as a liquid on the surface. So those are the two big questions. And the second one is the one that drives me. Where did the atmosphere go? And I love those pictures that I showed you because even with one still image, you can infer that an entire planet changed its atmosphere in the last three and a half billion years. You didn't have to see it happen. OK, so this is going to be a schematic diagram that shows you um, the different physical processes that we're going to talk about today during the colloquium. I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page and can understand all of the different places that the atmosphere might have gone. So this is a physics diagram. There it is. We're done. That's it. The atmosphere could have gone up or it could have gone down. If it doesn't do one of those two things, guess what? It's still atmosphere. So my job is totally easy. My mother is so proud, especially when I tell her that I only work on one of those two arrows, <laughs> just the up one. Um, she's like, Could you please just make it sound a little more complicated for other people? And I'm like, no, no, this is it. It's up. That's all I think about are the ups. Um, other people think about the downs. And the truth of it is both have happened at Mars. We know that both have happened. Mars has sent us meteorites from the surface. We know they come from Mars because when we crack them open and look at the air inside, they're not like Earth's atmosphere, but they're a lot like the Martian atmosphere. And when we look inside of those meteorites, sometimes we see carbonates. Carbonates require CO2 reacting with minerals in the presence of liquid water. And we all have all sorts of geochemical observations now from orbiting spacecraft that tell us that um, water has been incorporated into minerals in the surface as well, but just not a whole lot that we can see. So if there is water there, um, most of it should be buried. Another thing that we've seen from orbiting spacecraft in the past um, is atmosphere escaping to space. And I know it's hard to see, but this little red disk is Mars in schematic. The sun is over here. The solar wind would be blowing this way past Mars. And everywhere you see warm, happy colors, those are planetary ions, charged particles from the atmosphere, O+, plus, O2+, plus, CO2+. Plus. All these things come from CO2, which is what the Martian atmosphere is made from. So we've seen that with previous spacecraft as well. So really what my career is based around is evaluating the size of these two arrows in an absolute sense, relative to each other, and as a function of time. 
and I let pe other people think about the downs. I want to know about the up arrow. What's that been like over the last three and a half billion years? Okay, one thing to know about Mars is that it's not the same size as Earth. It's actually half the size of Earth, so this schematic diagram is a poor comparison in that regard. And the fact that Mars is about half the size of Earth means it has, um, you know, one-eighth the volume of Earth, about one-eighth the mass of Earth, less gravity to hold on to its atmosphere. So it's easier for particles on Mars to escape um, the, the gravity of the planet. Okay, that's, they have lower escape, required escape velocity to wander away from the planet. That's number one. So that's one reason to think that the ups might have been important at Mars compared to a planet like Earth. Number two, Mars lacks a global magnetic field. It doesn't have a magnetosphere like Earth does, and a magnetic field tells charged particles how to move. The solar wind is comprised of charged particles. They come screaming at the Earth at 400 kilometers per second, and the Earth says, please go around, and they listen. They come screaming at Mars at 400 kilometers per second, and Mars says, please go around, and the charged particles say, well, maybe, I don't know. Um, and some of them go crashing into the atmosphere. Not only that, Mars has low enough gravity that its atmosphere, especially its exosphere, the top fluffy parts, are really extended. And so those neutral particles wander way out into the solar wind, 10 times the planetary radius, and interact directly. So the Martian atmosphere is exposed more directly to charged particles flowing from the sun um, that can then, through various physical processes, remove those particles from the planet to space. So these are the two big reasons that we think atmospheric escape might have been an effective process at Mars relative to other planets. All planets experience atmospheric atmospheric escape. Earth is experiencing it right now, but we think it was perhaps very effective at Mars compared to other places. So we have a spacecraft um, orbiting Mars. It's been there since fall of 2014. MAVEN, Mars, Atmosphere, and Volatile Evolution. N, that's how we got the N in MAVEN. And the PI, Principal Investigator of the Mission, held a contest to see who could come up with the acronym for the mission. And then somehow, we don't know how it happened, um, but his, his contribution, the one that he submitted to the pot, is the one that he picked as the name of the mission. <laughs> and so we're not really allowed to make fun of the name that he picked, but the, it's, the N in MAVEN is at the end of evolution. Okay. It's an elliptical orbit um, around Mars. It gets close to the planet and far from the planet to study the types of processes that we're interested in. That orbit processes in local time. Sometimes it's close to the planet on the day side, other times at the night on the night side, sometimes at high latitudes, sometimes at low latitudes as well. So it's sampling the entire Martian system as the solar wind and the sun are interacting with the atmosphere. OK, scientific approach. I just showed you spacecraft data that say the atmosphere is escaping. What more do you need, you're thinking, right now, right? OK. Well, it turns out we do need more, and not just because we need funding. It turns out that there are actual science questions that we can't answer with just those data. And so you need a whole systems approach um, to have a prayer of answering these questions. And so this cartoon sort of highlights how MAVEN works with its measurements. Number one, we have to measure the drivers for escape. We need to measure the solar wind. We need to measure solar photons at extreme ultraviolet wavelengths that are important for the top parts of the atmosphere and energizing particles there. We need to measure solar storms. And this isn't done, hasn't been done directly on previous spacecraft. It's been done by proxy. Number two. Did that actually work? Yes. Uh, we have to measure the reservoirs for particle escape. That means not particles down here near the surface of the planet where you and I are. Those particles, even if they have escape energy, are not going to escape the planet because of collisions. They're not going to make it all the way out. What, we, what are, we're interested in are the top parts of the atmosphere, the collisional part near the top where things are still colliding, and then the part above that where collisions become rare. Any particle that makes it above the collisional region with enough energy it has a strong likelihood of escaping from the planet. So we need to understand those particle reservoirs. That hasn't been done before in conjunction with escape measurements. Number three, we need to measure escape both of charged particles and neutral particles. So we need the right types of instruments there. 
And then number four, we need to, to understand the big questions. Where did the atmosphere go? We need to use the measurements of what's happening today to tell us something about how the planets evolved over time, at least from this one process. So has escape to space of the Martian atmosphere been important over three and a half billion years? Or is it merely just fun physics, a little bit of a curiosity that's fun to think about? Or has it been important in changing the planet? And we have a couple of different approaches for getting at evolution. And you can ask me about them um, at any time. That's fine. OK, so we have a Brady Bunch of instruments on the spacecraft, nine different instruments to measure all of these things that I just said. Um, and I'll just briefly go through each one and say what it measures. Uh, this one measures ions in the solar wind, so basically protons. This one measures extreme ultraviolet coming from the sun. This one measures solar energetic particles, basically solar storm particles coming from the sun. They're solid state detectors. This one measures electrons coming from the sun nominally, but both of these measure ions and electrons anywhere in the Martian system. We have an ultraviolet spectrometer, imaging ultraviolet spectrometer to look at the reservoirs for particles in the upper atmosphere. A neutral gas and ion mass spectrometer, basically a particle sniffer that works when we are at low altitudes in those reservoirs for escape. Uh, a very unfortunately named instrument called STATIC um, that also measures ions in the Martian system. This one has mass discrimination. We can tell the difference between O plus and O2 plus and CO2 plus with this instrument. We have magnetometers. They're really cute. They sit on the ends of the solar panels. And we have a Langmuir probe. Um, and two of those together um, uh, with waves capability to measure the charge part properties of the upper atmosphere. Three of these instruments, EUV, IUVS, and LPW, were built at University of Colorado. The other instruments were either built at Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley, or at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. OK. Yeah, it varies. I mean, this one is the best one for scale because those are people standing behind it. The magnetometers would fit in your hand. The two sensors right there would fit in your hand. Um, and everything else is in between these two scales in some way. Mm -hmm. OK, this is hot off the presses. There was a press release on Friday that came from our mission and the Curiosity rover on the surface of Mars jointly, um, um, where we worked together. It turns out there was a solar event a couple of weeks ago. And that solar event was measured at the surface of Mars in terms of increased radiation dose that astronauts might have experienced. It was also experienced by our spacecraft in many different ways. But one of the most visually appealing ways is um, the appearance of bright aurora on the planet. And Mars doesn't have a global magnetic field. These are global aurora coming from energetic particles from the sun, electrons going crashing straight into the atmosphere, exciting atmospheric particles. And then when they relax, they emit light in the UV. Not only that, these were bright aurora. Uh, a typical auroral brightness for Earth is about 10 kilorayleys, something like that. These were 25 kilorayleys on Mars, everywhere in the sky. Okay, at ultraviolet wavelengths. Um, so it was really bright, and that's kind of fun to think about. We don't really have a good idea of what it might have looked like in the visible. Some scientists say, yes, this would have been visible, uh, would have been apparent at visible wavelengths. Other scientists don't know. Uh, there's not a lot of light pollution on Mars, so if something happened, you probably would have seen it. And, um, you know, that looked like pink fuzz, so let me give you a sense. This, this is an image before the aurora happened in ultraviolet wavelengths of this disk of Mars. It's, you know, it's somewhere in here. Okay, and then let's run through a time series from September 13th through about September 15th. There are only about eight panels there. There it is. And it's real bright on the limb because you're looking through more atmosphere on the limb. Okay, so it was real bright. Um, and that's a lot of fun. And this gets at um, maybe Maven's fundamental science. We measured the drivers. We actually measured the energetic electrons that caused these aurora. And we measured the reservoirs for escape and how they responded to those drivers, at least in one way. Um, this may not get directly to escape, but I'm working on that right now to see if escape rates increased, at least for charged particles. And it maybe doesn't tell you about evolution, but it's really fun. 
Okay. Now let's talk about ion escape, um, which is what one of the things that I do for the mission. Um, and this is, these are some figures that I made early on in the mission when we only had about six months of data at our disposal. And so what I do really requires kindergarten skills, not much more than that, um, which is good. That means I'm capable of doing it. And I draw, I close my eyes and I draw an imaginary surface around Mars, a shell around Mars. You can actually see the surface of Mars here someplace. So it's at about one and a half Mars radii or something like that. And every time our spacecraft passes through that imaginary shell, I look at our ion measurements and I pick out the oxygen and O2 plus, atomic and molecular oxygen and CO2 charged particles that our spacecraft measures. And I paint by number. That's it. So it's kindergarten skills. Um, and I paint by number on the day side and the night side. I don't have a color bar on here. Um, but blue means that particles in those locations, when I average up or take the median of all the observations in that cell, um, the particles are moving away from the planet. The darker the blue, the higher the flux of ions moving away from the planet. So there are a lot of ions leaving the planet on the night side, and you can see holes in our coverage here. On the day side, there are ions leaving the planet up here near the top, and I'll explain what top means in a minute. It's not necessarily the North Geographic Pole, but the reds mean there are ions moving towards the planet there that are more numerous than any ions leaving the planet. So on the day side, there are a lot of ions headed towards the planet. Okay, since then, we've had another two years worth of observations, and at 11.30 this morning, while there was a break in my schedule, I um, revised these, but I've um, revised them as flat maps. So remember, day side and night side. And let's go over here and look at the bottom one. Everything in the left hand of the plot is the day side of the planet. Everything in the right side of the plot is the night side of the planet. The color bars are there now, and it's log scaled in flux with outward and inward flux. And I'm, um, I don't know if I'm proud or embarrassed to say that I think this is the first time in my career that I've had 10 orders of magnitude on a single figure um, in my field, but it's true. And everything that I just said before is still true. There's a lot of escape on the night side of the planet. And on the day side of the planet in the south, which I will define in just a second, I promise. Ions are moving towards the planet. You can see streaks of blue moving through and some striations. Those are probably solar storms that happened. And as the spacecraft was sampling that part of the sphere at that time, the solar storms are swamping out any other signal that was there. OK, what do I mean by north and south? Well, when we think about ions moving, we have to also think about an electric field that might be accelerating them. And it turns out that a, a useful thing to think about is V cross B, a motional electric field. The solar wind is moving at 400 kilometers per second. There's an embedded magnetic field in the solar wind. From an ion's perspective at Mars, there's uh, a flow moving towards it with an entrained magnetic field, and that creates an electric field, V cross B electric field. If the magnetic field in the solar wind changes its orientation, then now the electric field is going to point this way. If it changes it again, now the electric field will point this way. But the ions should always move according to the electric field. So one thing that we often do when we're looking at data is put it into an electric field frame. We take all of the observations, we ignore Mars geography, and we just put it into a frame where the electric field always points this way. And so that's what these maps are. So here at the top is where the electric field is pulling ions away from the planet. Here at the bottom is where ele the electric field would be pushing ions in to the planet. And that's why we see it in the way that we do. OK, what are the rates? I don't know, you know, an order of magnitude above Avogadro's number per second, something like that. Instead, maybe a quarter pound cheeseburger per second, leaving Mars of charged particles. OK, that's fun to think about. And this is for energies greater than 10 EV. The escape energy for oxygen is 2 eV. So I haven't gone all the way down to escape energy. Those data are really hard to work with at the low energy. So I've kept them out of the maps, although I have them at my disposal. And only mass is greater than 9 AMU. What does that mean? Well, if I account for all the other energies, and I also remember that neutral particles are escaping from the planet, let's just be friends and call this 10 to the 26. 
particles per second because the people who study neutral particles say that their escape that they study is an order of magnitude greater than the escape that I study. Um, and I, it's not just because they want to feel special, I think that that's actually maybe true. So I've assumed maybe that neutral escape is a factor of five greater than ion escape and we can use this rough number. 10 to the 26 particles per second escaping from the atmosphere today. What does this mean over time? Well, if all of that oxygen came from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you can compute directly how the pressure should have changed as a result in the atmosphere. And that means 100 millibars were lost over 4 billion years of Mars history. That's 10 times what's there today, more than 10 times what's there today. That's a lot. This is important. We need to be thinking about this. But in terms of giving enough pressure for water to be liquid on the surface, it's not enough. We need maybe 500 millibars or one bar of atmosphere for water to be liquid on the surface. So this accounts for a lot of escape by today's standards, but maybe over the history of the planet it doesn't account for enough to explain the change that we've seen. It gets worse. If instead we assume all that oxygen came from water instead of CO2, this is the problem with oxygen, it comes from multiple places then we can account for a liquid global layer of 2.5 meters spread over the entire surface of the planet. And people are talking about an inventory of water for the planet that's on the order of 40 or 50 meters thick that needs to have been there a long time ago. So again, a lot by today's standards, an order of magnitude than what's there today, we think, uh, that we can see anyway, um, but not enough to explain the change. So why am I here telling you about this experiment that didn't give me good results? Why am I still seeming a little bit cheery? Um, and it, maybe it was the caffeine right before, I'm kind of feeling it at the moment. Um, but instead it's this idea, it's, you can always draw a cartoon, so let's draw a cartoon. And we are measuring atmospheric loss today on Mars. And that atmospheric loss is driven by processes from the sun, solar photons at extreme ultraviolet wavelengths, and the solar wind. And our observations of sun-type stars elsewhere in the galaxy at different stages of their life cycle tell us that both of these things were more robust long ago, early in solar system history. So really, when I told you how much atmosphere has been lost, I've only integrated under this dashed line curve to tell you how much atmosphere has been lost. I haven't accounted for the fact that all the drivers were much more robust a long time ago. Not only that, solar storms and solar flares and things like that were probably um, more energetic and more frequent a long time ago based on our observations of other stars. So that's why I'm still reasonably cheerful here. Um, we're in the right ballpark, and if we can account for all this loss, then we really might be cooking at that point. So solar storm influences could have been big at Mars, and we've had, um, studied a couple of the solar storm events, and we've seen ion fluxes that are higher than we would expect. The problem is I can't make one of those whole shells for you because solar storms don't last very long. They'll last a few hours or maybe a day or two. So if I were to try and make one of those shells I showed you before, it would just be kind of a few lines around the shell. And I couldn't use my third grade skills and add up the whole paint by number thing and give you a robust number. So this is um, a reason that MAVEN needs to stay in orbit and continue receiving funding for 40 more years. Okay. Okay, so now, yep, go right ahead. Uh, you can still do the relative percentage of the increase. You, ca you can. You can measure that as a total abundance. You can, and the, the, the issue that, you, you can, and when those fluxes increase, they'll sometimes increase by a factor of two, sometimes five or ten, sometimes even two orders of magnitude. And the issue that we talk about is the toothpaste tube. You know, you're getting more flux here from this extra input, but does that mean flux someplace else went down? as a result. And so we really can't answer that question yet. I think all of us think that atmospheric escape increases during solar storms, but quantifying it more specifically than an order of magnitude um, is really difficult right now. Yeah? Um, how are solar storms triggered and how often are they occurring? Wow. First let's define, let me say, I don't know. Um, and then let me talk for a minute or two until you forget the question and then we move on. Okay, so um, first let's define what we mean by solar storm. And there are three different inputs that can happen there. Solar flares, so those are photons 
X-ray wavelengths, extreme ultraviolet wavelengths. Um, and they're happening all the time, but you know, they have uh, different magnitudes and different energy inputs on a log scale. Um, number two, CMEs, coronal mass ejections. These are the big magnetic clouds that come out from the sun that was sort of illustrated in this last slide. Um, and those also happen throughout the solar cycle. Sometimes they're little, sometimes they're big. We've seen one moderate one and one big one in the um, three years that MAVEN's been orbiting Mars, but this has been kind of a lame solar cycle so far. And the big one that we saw just a few weeks ago has happened really at solar minimum, which is quite unexpected. Most of the big ones happen on the declining phase of the solar cycle. But they're also happening all the time. It's just did a big one happen or not? And then the third thing are solar energetic particles. These are not distinct from the other two. Flares are associated with energetic particles coming out from the sun to you know, MeV energies, sometimes 100 MeV energies. And um, solar energetic particles are also associated with the CMEs. Sometimes they're accelerated in the shock front of the expanding cloud. Sometimes they come from the sun itself. So there are those three different energy inputs. They're all happening all the time. And they're sort of a log scale in intensity and um, frequency of events. Yeah. OK, so now we're going to enter new territory. And I'm going to talk for. 20-ish minutes in this new territory about the fun physics that's going on um, on my side of the MAVEN mission. Um, often I would instead talk about neutral particle escape or aurora or things like that, and I'm happy to talk about that too. Um, but I was feeling more adventurous, I guess, this time. So let's do this. OK, the up and down arrow diagram before was, of course, tongue in cheek. Um, but you don't get a mission funded from NASA with just those two arrows. You include those. You simplify. But then you have to say there's real physics here, real stuff that we're capable of answering. And so this is more the flow chart. In the upper atmosphere of Mars, you know, there are all of these inputs from the sun. And there's photochemistry and diffusion and collision-free regions. And then at, at some point, you have to ask yourself whether you're an ion or a neutral particle. And then you come to a little white box if you're one of those particles. And you say, do I have escape velocity or not? And you can navigate yourself all the way around this diagram if you want. Every white box is a different process for escaping particles. And it involves different physics, each one of those boxes. All of these red things have to do with plasma processes. All of the blue things have to do with neutral par uh, processes. Um, and this white box here actually contains two processes. So there are about six different processes that we want to evaluate with MAVEN observations. OK. So we can start to see some of those processes in action if you're um, really smart, like my postdoc. Okay, so she, she's way beyond the kindergarten skills thing. Um, and so what she's done is she's taken MAVEN data and averaged them together um, in sort of this slice that goes from noon to midnight with the sun over here on the right. And she colored the regions around Mars by how many atmospheric ions are typically seen in those regions on average. And she also, because we have ion measurements and we can measure ions coming from different directions, we can construct moments of the distribution. We can get densities. We can get velocity vectors as well from our ion measurements. And so all of these arrows give you a sense of the t average velocities of those ions in those locations. And there are three distinct regions in a diagram like this. Number one, behind the planet, these are little arrowheads with almost no tail on them. Okay, so these are slow moving ions, but there are a lot of them right behind the planet. So these are cold ions escaping behind the planet um, away from the sun. That's one process that's pulling ions out. Number two, these guys are all going whoop, 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 like that all in the same direction, uh, kind of along the V cross B electric field. And they have a lot of energy. We call this the pickup ion plume. And this was, um, we were really happy that we observed it with MAVEN because the previous spacecraft had looked for it and couldn't find it, even though all the computer simulations said it's going to be there, it's going to be there. And it turns out the, the orientation of the instruments on the spacecraft, which way they were looking, things like that, were disguising this feature until we got there. And it turns out this is maybe 25, 30% of all the ion escape from Mars that had been missed before. And so she saw this. 
the third one is the fact uh, is down here, not very many particles, and all the arrowheads are pointing back towards Mars. These are oxygen atoms that wandered away from Mars in the exosphere. They were still gravitationally bound, but then they became ionized, either by sunlight or collisions. And as soon as they became ionized, the solar wind told them how to move, and that they gyrated, just like ions do. And they gyrated right back into the planet. And when they do that, they go crashing into the atmosphere to the collisional portion. They get rid of their energy to the surrounding particles, and some of those particles escape. And the efficiency factor there can sometimes be as high as 100 to 1. One particle comes in, 100 splash out. This process is called sputtering. So you can see in this one map at least three different escape processes at work. Uh, she's also done um, a version of this map when the photon flux from the sun was high and when the photon flux from the sun was low. And she noticed that in the plume, the escape flux, the escape rate, really doesn't change as the sun gets brighter or dimmer. Okay? But behind the planet, that cold escape in the tail changes a lot. So it's not enough to make my little shells and just say ion escape and talk about ion escape in general. I can give you the rate today, but if we're ever going to extrapolate back in time to earlier epochs when the sun was brighter at these wavelengths, we have to think about these processes separately. Okay, so I have a graduate student that got interested in this plume feature. And she um, used to model galaxies with MHD models and somehow decided that she was going to come work on Mars and maybe exoplanets. And so rather than working with the data, she decided to take models of how Mars interacts with the solar wind from different people in the community. Some MHD models, some that go beyond MHD and include kinetic motion of ions, and compare them all. And what she's done just in the past couple weeks is look at um, Ohm's law in these models. So um, Ohm's law, you can write like this if you're going to leave off a, a pressure gradient term like that. But these are you know, maybe the first two important terms in Ohm's law. One is V cross B that I just talked about, a motional electric field. And it acts on ions with velocity different than the fluid velocity. So there's a difference between the species you're thinking about and the average fluid velocity. And um, that average fluid velocity is the one that's dragging the magnetic field. So anytime there's a difference in velocities, there's an electric field associated with that. And it turns out in the models, you can evaluate every single one of these terms and compute the V cross B electric field as a vector. And so she's done that. She can also look at J cross B. And that, of course, acts wherever a magnetic field is curved. Whenever you have a curved magnetic field, there's a current associate associated with that curve in the magnetic field. Um, and, that, um, and that can be evaluated also from the models. So she's done both of these things and gone in to look at the models at the plume to try and understand the physics of the plume. And this is what she's found. On the left, this is a multi-fluid MHD model. So it's an MHD model um, where each individual ion species has its own um, set of uh, uh, continuity equations, energy, mass, and momentum. And they're all linked together by chemistry and by Ohm's law. So this is the density of O2 plus ions. And you're looking at Mars from the direction of the sun towards Mars. And the um, yellower colors mean there's high density. And there's this little wispy feature at the top, which is the pickup ion plume that the models have predicted would be there. And it's really thin. And it gets kind of broader as you move up and away from the planet. And if you look closely, it gets broader as you're down towards the bottom of the planet as well. At the same time, she's um, computed the magnitude of the V cross B electric field from the model. And it turns out in the plume, V cross B is actually small, which is weird because it's all moving in the direction that V cross B should tell it to move. Um, but these particles have already been accelerated. They've been accelerated perhaps down low. Um, and they're already moving in the right direction. So they're not moving at a velocity different than the velocity that's dra dragging the magnetic field. They're just kind of already going. Where V cross B is large is in regions nearby to the plume. That's where they're getting some acceleration. So maybe things are being accelerated over here and then finding their way into the plume. That would be weird. How could that happen? 
Well, she's also looked at J cross B, that second term, curvature of the magnetic field. And now I have to take a brief pause and explain how, in broad terms, how Mars would interact with the solar wind. So Mars, the sun's over there. Mars is here as a big sphere. Sunlight is hitting the atmosphere and creating charges at the top of the atmosphere. That's the ionosphere. And that makes Mars a big conductor. At the same time, the solar wind over here with its big magnetic field is flowing towards Mars. And when it sees a conductor, it's shielded out from the conductor. So the uh, magnetic field lines wrap around the planet, kind of like throwing spaghetti noodles at a basketball. And then they slip up and over, and then they come out, and then they straighten out again. Right behind the planet, they're, they're really bent like this, okay? And we call that the magneto tail of Mars, right behind the planet. And then they slowly straighten out again. Okay, so there's a lot of bend in the magnetic field, and that'll create J cross B, as we talked about before. It's curvature of the magnetic field that creates it. This is the same diagram as before, maybe a, a different snapshot or something like that. And over here, she's taken J cross B, but just one vector component, the vector component that's in the plane here, uh, in the terminator plane of the planet, basically the dawn dusk plane. And it's only the um, component in this left-right direction. And what she finds is there's red on one side and blue on the other. And that either means ions are being pushed apart from each other or towards each other. And so then you have to look at the signs here and think about how we define the coordinate system. It turns out ions are being pushed into the plume from the sides. The curvature of the magnetic fields is making ions move towards the center of that curved field line structure. So they might have been accelerated by V cross B, and then they're directed in to the plume, and then off they go and escape. Um, and so I think this is a really good illustration of how particle acceleration might work in this plume feature. OK, now let's go to one more physics thing. Um, and this was more or less the topic of my PhD thesis, which um, took place about uh, years ago, which was too many. Um, and it turns out Mars doesn't have a magnetic field, a global magnetic field like Earth. I already told you that. But Mars does have small scale magnetic fields in the crust. They're magnetized pieces of rock that are huge, hundreds of kilometers wide, thousands of kilometers wide, hundreds of kilometers north-south and you know maybe tens of kilometers thick of coherently magnetized material. It's 10 to 20 times more strongly magnetized than Earth, um, similar features in Earth's crust. Okay, so they're strong magnetic fields. They're attached to the planet, kind of glued in the rocks, and the planet you know, is spinning on its axis. So sometimes the sun sees strong magnetic fields, other times the solar wind doesn't see strong magnetic fields. They're really interesting. They're still a couple orders of magnitude down in strength from Earth's global magnetic field at these altitudes, but they're strong enough that they can locally shield the atmosphere from the solar wind. Okay. And they're in the oldest crust on Mars, the oldest regions on Mars. So I have a, another student, Tristan, and uh, he's used electron observations to try to figure out when those magnetic field lines are closed and when they've opened up and are sort of waving about in the solar wind, when they connect out to the solar wind. Because you can think of the atmosphere as being shielded when they're closed, and in local little places, they're little escape hatches out to the solar wind where particles can come in and go out. Particles coming in can cause aurora in the crustal fields. Particles going out can be contributing to atmospheric escape. So he's tried to figure out when and where this happens. And he does that by using pitch angle distributions of electrons. Are electrons moving along the magnetic field line with pitch angle of zero? Are they moving anti-parallel with pitch angle 180? Or are they just orbiting around the field line with pitch angle 90? And in this magnetic field structure here, where you have basically an absorber at the bottom, an atmosphere, any electron that comes in contact with the collisional atmosphere will be lost. And so any electrons that have pitch angles near 0 or 180 are going to be lost from a distribution in this type of configuration. And you're going to have a lot of electrons near 90 degree pitch angle. So we observe that in the MAVEN data. And any time he observes that, he says, ah, oh, that's a closed field line. Also, when we're on the night side of the planet in darkness, 
there's not really a source for electrons. And so when we observe electron fluxes with basically zero flux um, within error, we say, OK, there are no electrons on that field line within measurement error. This is also a closed field line um, on the night side of the planet because there are no electrons there. What so these are super thermal electrons. Uh, he does this at two different energies. Um, w the one that's most reliable here is 100 eV to 300 eV. Okay. And photoelectrons at Mars are typically 25 eV on the day side of the planet. And he also looks at 20 to 40 eV as well. OK, so he can make a map of every time this happens. And when you see white colors, it happens a lot, like all the time. And it turns out in the crustal field regions, if you remember that map of, from before, on the night side of the planet, they're closed fields all the time. Okay? And there are little places, even within those crustal fields, that are open quite a bit. These are the little escape hatches. Not only that, he can look and see how this varies. And I'm not going to go through this whole thing. Instead, I'm going to explain it in words. Um, but here's what I want you to notice. Just pick these two sets, the blue and the red. Blue is higher than the red on, um, when, you get to, um, when you're before midnight on the night side of the planet. After midnight, red is higher than blue. Okay? And these are the percentage of the time that certain types of crustal fields are open versus closed. And what it means is a crustal field location that's open before midnight is closed after midnight. That's what the flipping of those two colored um, sets of data mean. And uh, on the con uh, just the opposite, a crustal field line that's closed before midnight opens up after midnight. The implication is that many crustal fields on the planet, maybe all of them, undergo magnetic reconnection once per Mars rotation, which is really cool to think about. Okay, so these little escape patches are closing and then opening, and then closing, and then opening, escapes happening. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. And so this is something that we have to factor into our thinking of not only how escape works today, but how might it have worked long ago when there were maybe more crustal fields on the planet, uh, on the surface of the planet. How are we doing? OK. Not too badly. OK, so here's the last set of physics that I want to talk about. Now that we're talking about crustal fields, and crustal fields get me really excited, um, I have an undergraduate who just um, graduated in May and is sticking around until November 1st. To, um, she's taking a year off before she applies to grad school. She's sticking around until November 1st to finish a paper, and then I think she's traveling for a few months. And what she's done is taken magnetic field observations when the spacecraft flies through the crustal fields, fl flies through these cusp regions, the escape patches. And she's looked at magnetic field observations, both the total magnetic field and three different vector components. And she uses the particle data to tell us when we're in an open field region. And that's what these two vertical lines are. And when that happens, sometimes you see these little blips in the horizontal components of the magnetic field, little perturbations in the magnetic field. And here you see a big one in the horizontal magnetic field and in the radial component of the magnetic field, big blips. And she's collected blips, a thousand blips, or a thousand magnetic field perturbations. What can perturb a magnetic field? A current is what perturbs a magnetic field. A current is what changes a magnetic field. And so what she's thought about is the fact that curl of B gives you a current. You can express cur curl of B as a current. And again, I'm not going to take you through all of this, but she's done a lot of cartoon thinking. What if there was a line current that was parallel to the background magnetic field? If that happened, then the um, field that's generated from that current would circulate around the current and would be a perturbation. And if Maven flew through that perturbation, what would we see on those diagrams that we just looked at? Then she did it if we flew through the center or if we flew up the current. What if it was a line, what if it was a sheet current instead of a line current? What if the current were um, orthogonal to the background magnetic field? And so she had a little whiteboard, and for like two weeks, she was drawing all these diagrams. And I think she was saying bad words a lot, but never in front of me, and then figuring out what we would see.
And then when she rotated her data into a minimum variance frame, a principal components frame, then she got really excited and she came rushing into my office and she said, I see what I thought we would see. And she saw exactly the signatures that she had predicted we would see. Not only that, she can distinguish different types of events in her data. And so she's put that together now in a map where the gray scale is the elevation angle of the magnetic field. Anywhere you see dark are cusps of magnetic field, vertically oriented magnetic field. And these perturbations are all happening in the cusps. Okay? And some scattered ones at other locations as well. Okay? And she's um, taken the strength of the perturbation and colored by strength of the perturbation. And there are some regions that are susceptible to pretty strong perturbations, pretty strong currents. And those are exciting to someone like me because strong currents are strong particle accelerators. Strong p particle accelerators are going to be able to pull particles out of the top part of the atmosphere and maybe contribute to escape more effectively. And you can do some back of the envelope um, calculations of what the current density is in units of microamps per meter squared. And it turns out in Earth's auroral regions you get a typical current density of about one microamp per meter squared. Does, does that seem about right? Okay. And for Mars, the current densities that we more typically see are one-tenth of that, an order of magnitude down. But sometimes they get up to a few microamps per meter squared. So this could be effective, especially with lower escape velocity at Mars, at yanking particles out of the night side ionosphere, which is pretty fun. OK, so now in my last couple of minutes, what's next for MAVEN and um, what are the, what's the big picture here? Um, so we've been in orbit for three Earth years, about one and a half Mars years around the planet. Um, every two or three years, we have to propose for new funding to continue science observations. That'll happen for us in the spring. NASA hasn't told us yet whether we're proposing for one year of funding or three years of funding, which is great fun, which means we're currently right now Next week, when we have our team meeting, we're going to have a big two-hour discussion about what we're going to propose for three years of continued funding. Because um, if you don't start making those plans and then NASA says, yep, it's three years, then you're already too late. So we're thinking about what we're going to do for the next three years, even though we may have to propose for only one year of funding. Um, and we continue to make observations of the drivers, the reservoirs, the escape, and trying to synthesize it into a big picture of evolution as well. OK, so why, um, why should you give a darn? I think there are three reasons to give a darn. Number one is one that I really harped on in the beginning. What was this transition in the Martian atmosphere like? Did the Mars atmosphere change in big ways, like we said? We think that's robust. But did escape to space play a role in it? We're pretty sure that escape to space played a major role in changing the atmosphere. Um, but we're still not 100% certain of the relative importance of the up arrow to the down arrow today. And so I've had some conversations starting in the past two weeks with a couple people about thinking about that. Number two, one that um, makes me really excited is thinking about the importance of a magnetic field. Because we have one example of life in our solar system, and it's on the one terrestrial planet that has a global magnetic field. And those are the statistics of small numbers. It's really hard to hang your hat on that statement. And I want to know if having a magnetic field means you get to keep your atmosphere, or if the magnetic field really doesn't make a difference. And I can present arguments for and against that idea. There are reasons to think that magnetic fields really don't matter, and there are other reasons to think that they could be very important. And I think Mars is a great place to answer this question. If you try and compare Mars and Earth, that's tough. Because those two planets are different in so many other ways. They're different in size. They're different in distance from the sun. There are difference in, differences in atmospheric makeup. What I think we should do is compare Mars to Mars. Because Mars has magnetized regions and unmagnetized regions. And if we can compare escape processes in those two places on Mars, we can start to answer the more general fundamental question of the importance of magnetic fields. The third one is exoplanets. Um, Mars is not just a planet that we're interested in. It's our nearest, one of our nearest laboratories for studying atmospheres in general. And it's one of our nearest laboratories for studying atmospheres of unmagnetized planets in general. And so applying the lessons of Mars to these potentially billions of habitable 
quote unquote planets orbiting other stars might help us start narrowing down the list of places we should be investigating. It might help us before we have direct imaging and understanding which planets are likely to be able to retain an atmosphere or an atmosphere that's thick enough to support liquid water at the surface. Um, along those lines, NASA headquarters has realized that it's a multidisciplinary problem. They've created a recursive acronym. The N in Nexus stands for Nexus. Again, I didn't get to contribute there. So it's Nexus for Exoplanetary System Science. And they have people from, uh, who are associated um, with different subdisciplines of NASA science, heliophysics, the sun and solar wind, astrophysics, uh, other stars and Earth and planetary science. And these different centers are tasked with thinking about what makes a planet habitable, how are we going to find habitable planets around other stars. And uh, here I am down here with a group that's halfway between heliophysics and Earth and planetary science. We're starting to think about porting these lessons over. Okay, um, so here's everything I just said. MAVEN is a cool mission that measures atmospheric escape from Mars. It has a lot of cool physics associated with it that I think is really exciting. Um, but I like using that uh, physics in the service of big picture questions about how planets evolve, habitability, things like that. And our data suggests that escape has altered the climate. Um, and I think the lessons from MAVEN can, I think MAVEN, even though it's paid for out of the Mars program at NASA, it's a Mars mission, I really think MAVEN can teach us about how planets everywhere work. All right, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? On Earth, we know how long approximately it takes to make a big canyon with water. Yeah. Okay. So if we want to extrapolate that and say there was originally a certain amount of uh, mass of water that's making big canyons on Mars, can't we then extrapolate what the evaporation rates are over the four million years of Mars? Yeah, there, there are two separate timescales in here. One is the timescale to form the features in the first place, which tells you how long a robust atmosphere had to have been there. And then there's the timescale for removal, which might be an entirely different uh, timescale as well. Um, and so I'm, I'm more versed in the second time scale. And we think that the robust atmosphere was there, you know, between 3.5 and 3 billion years ago. And that the time scale for removal um, is hundreds of millions of years or something like that. So you can kind of ballpark in that area. I've sometimes been asked if, you know, about these ideas for terraforming Mars by crashing comets into it and making a more robust atmosphere. Isn't that a dumb idea because it would all just escape? And I think that's not a dumb idea because if you could create more atmosphere on Mars, that's great on human time scales, but you might have to crash another comet in 100 million years later to keep the things going. And so that evaporation rates that you have now are of the order of three or four magnitudes off. Yes, they're low. And so we're, we're relying on that cartoon right now. If this process is going to be super important or the sole driver of atmospheric change, then we're relying on the early sun, where those drivers were um, up by two orders of magnitude across the board. And the other thing is when you merge atmospheric escape with whatever must have gone into the subsurface, maybe you need those two things together to explain the change. Yeah. So we have time for one more question. Do we know Mars never had a global magnetic field? We believe that Mars did have a global magnetic field. And the reason for this is the presence of the crustal fields. They're so strong that ideas for how rocks acquire magnetization, all of those ideas fall apart except magnetization in the presence of an ancient dynamo. Does so, that screw up your extrapolation? No, because, um, because we can look at the surface and we see the density of craters in the surface. And for a planetary scientist, the density of craters tells you the age of the surface, approximately. And we can look at where there's strong magnetic field, and we can come up with a date for when that magnetic field must have shut off. And that date is about 4.1 billion years ago. The impact flux, the heavy bombardment, probably continued to about 3.8 billion years ago. And the riverbeds that we see on the surface are younger than that. 
They're about 3.5 billion years old or, or 3.2 billion years old, I think, is the youngest one. So in a chronology, it's magnetic field acquired when the planet is born. It's a small baked potato, so it cools off quickly. The magnetic field shuts off at 4.1 billion years. Hell continues to rain down in the form of impacts till 3.8 billion years. And then the atmosphere still must be robust enough to carve, uh, create these features that we've observed. Yeah. So th thank you very much. Thank you again. Thanks.